Okay, everyone. Everyone in the auditorium has received their warning for disruptive behavior. Okay, we're going to try this again. No more warnings for disruptive behavior. If you disrupt the event, you will be asked to leave. Thank you. So, to my list of thank yous, I am now going to add the Seattle Police Department. <laughs> So originally I was thanking the library when we were interrupted. Not a good look on your part, folks. <laughs> um, especially Marcellus Turner and, um, yeah, give him a big thank you. And um, Cara Cranholm, um, we really just want to thank you for all your help and your patience and your professionalism. They've been an absolute joy to work with. So. I uh, want to thank Max Wilbert for doing the live stream, because <laughs> I sure couldn't do it. <laughs> um, SOS Rights, which is Save Our Sex-Based Rights, um, they are, yep. That's uh, a new local women's group, uh, which co-sponsored and did a whole bunch of the groundwork for this event. Uh, could not have done it without them. Um, there's a contract form, a contact form over here somewhere if you want to be in touch. There's, you can, you know, just fill it out and your information will absolutely be kept private. So feel free to join up with them. They're doing great stuff already. And finally, I'm a founding member of WOLF. Um, and So I am, I am actually in awe of the women who have made this organization a force to be reckoned with. So special thanks especially goes out to Natasha Chart, Jennifer Chavez, and Kara Dansky. My mother was a librarian. She was. <laughs> I remember that hallowed day at age six when I finally got my own library card. And I don't mean this as a joke. I'm pretty sure that gravitas was similar to what the Catholic kids felt on their first communion. It was that important. My mother loved books. She believed in the power of stories to guide us and the power of ideas to transform us. There's a reason the First Amendment is first. For democracy to work. People need to be able to gather, and they need to be able to speak. It really is that simple. For my mother, anyone engaged enough to be hungry, she wanted them fed. Now, we live in cynical times, but that was her calling, not just her job. My mother was also a feminist. In 1968, the poet Muriel Rokeyser wrote, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. Propelled by collective pain and inchoate rage, women like my mother found the words, saw the pattern, called it political, created theory, and built a movement to liberate women. 
and the world did split open. A short history of feminist accomplishments, rape crisis hotlines, battered women's shelters, abortion and birth control on demand, sexual harassment laws, equal funding for girls' sports, a storming of the barricades in the trades and professions, and a flowering of lesbian culture. We are now supposed to sneer at them for knowing that women are women. But it was exactly that knowing that let them change the world. We owe them everything. As for my father, well, my father's people fought off the Nazis to then lose catastrophically to Stalin. My father survived by being a child refugee and then an immigrant. And that's why I was born in the United States and why I have no extended family. I'm not the only person on this stage tonight whose lineage is a pile of corpses, given the global horrors of the 20th century that shouldn't be a surprise. The thing that does surprise me, we, and by that I mean human race we, were supposed to have learned from those horrors. But if you had told me 20 years ago that one day I would not be able to speak in public unless surrounded by a phalanx of armed men, I would not have believed you. We expected authoritarianism from the right. We weren't prepared for it from the left. No, we weren't. So a brief catalog of what the left is doing. Women have lost their jobs. They've lost their publishers. They've lost custody of their kids. They've been threatened so badly they've had to move. And they've been physically assaulted. The most basic facts of biology are now considered a hate crime, which means the reality of women's lives are back to being unspeakable. Children's bodies, especially their future fertility and sexual function, are being destroyed permanently. The worst part is that no one believes us. Civic institutions that were built as bulwark against power are crumbling. Journalists are afraid of losing their jobs. And if that doesn't chill you, nothing will. Academia has fallen, though Hogwarts still stands. <laughs> And people I counted as friends and comrades just want to keep their heads down so they can keep their jobs, hoping that the fever will break because this can't go on. It can, that's the thing. It can get worse. The left has become unrecognizable, and we are in terrible freefall, not because we've come unmoored, but because we've been thrown from the movements we've spent our lives building. And for what? For knowing that a woman is an adult human female. I will never stop knowing that. I will never say five when the answer is four. <laughs> My parents, as people and as small participants in human history, taught me better. I'll end with my favorite words from, of course, Andrea Dworkin. Remember, resist, do not comply. So it is my great honor to introduce three other women who will not comply. They are brave, they are smart. I'm in awe to say they are my friends. First up is the incomparable Megan Murphy. <laughs> Megan is a writer in Vancouver, in Vancouver uh, British Columbia, and the founder and editor of Feminist Current, Megan Murphy. Hey, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> um, I actually do first want to thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Maybe you would. Um, 
<laughs> it is a brave feat in and of itself, just showing up to events like this. Um, it demonstrates a commitment to supporting women's rights, free speech, and true democratic principles. <laughs> These events do not happen on their own. It seems people are not clamoring to offer space, funding, and security so that feminists can say blasphemous things like men are not women. <laughs> These events happen purely through women's will and organizing. They happen because independent women and women's groups make them happen and refuse to back down under pressure, bullying, endless obstacles, and threats. And flutes, apparently. <laughs> this has been true across the globe, from New Zealand to Scotland to Britain to Toronto to Vancouver and now to Seattle. Women struggle, women fight, and women organize. We do this because we have to, because we have no choice. We have always had to force our voices into the public realm to demand to be heard and to demand our rights. And despite all the progress we thought we'd made, now is unfortunately no different. Despite endless claims online that we're funded by evil right-wing institutions and that we're all getting rich off of all of this, <laughs> that we're somehow operating from a position of power and privilege rather from, than from the ground up, the truth is that this is the women's movement. This is the independent grassroots women's movement. The same one that's been around since the 1800s when women had to fight tooth and nail simply to be recognized as persons and be included in public life. This is feminism, this is women's liberation, and those who are trying to stop us, to shut us down, to shut us up, to have us fired, to terrify us into silence with endless violent threats, who try to bully you all into staying home by screaming misogynist insults in your faces simply for trying to participate in a conversation about women's rights. These are the regressive, backwards, anti-feminist authoritarians. This is the backlash. This is the hate. This is the bigotry, which I like to remind people means intolerance toward those who hold different opinions from oneself. There is manipulative rhetoric and efforts to frame this backlash as progress, but it is not. It is the same woman hating and the same efforts to force us back into the home, back into silence, and back into fear as it always has been. We are uppity women who dare speak the truth, and that is why they want to burn us at the stake. And we cannot stop saying this, we cannot stop reminding the world that this is true. We cannot stop telling and retelling history because history repeats itself when we don't, as we are seeing today, via the so-called trans rights movement. I say so-called because I want to be clear that this isn't about trans rights. There are no rights being fought for for trans people within this activism. The activists outside are not fighting to create services and safe spaces for trans-identified people. They're certainly not fighting for the children told they're trans because they like or dislike the color pink, being put on puberty blockers, hormones, and on a path to surgery and sterility. Rather, this is a fight to end women's rights, to destroy the very foundation for women's rights, and, in fact, to destroy the women's movement itself. I'm not being hyperbolic. If we can't define women as adult human females and argue that women share a particular experience in this world and have experienced historical oppression due only to having been born female, there is no basis for women's rights.
We cannot defend women's spaces and women's organizing if there's no such thing as a woman, or if a woman is anything anyone says it is, based only on a feeling, an announcement, or an affinity towards uncomfortable shoes and lacy underwear. <laughs> I spoke with uh, Lee Lakeman this week. Uh, if you aren't familiar with her, you should be. <laughs> um, she headed up Vancouver Rape Relief and Women's Shelter, Canada's longest standing rape crisis center for decades. And, and she reminded me that the transition houses that were built for women during the second wave were not simply shelters. They were political spaces. Spaces where theory and analysis happened, spaces of consciousness raising, they were activist spaces. Vancouver Rape Relief faced a long court battle in the mid-90s, which is often misinterpreted as an effort to ensure a woman-only policy, misconstrued by anti-feminist activists as trans-exclusionary, that in fact was about their right to determine their own membership. In 1995, Kimberly Nixon, a trans-identified male, filed a human rights complaint against Vancouver Rape Relief after being rejected from a training group for counselors. So, Rape Relief operates on a peer counseling model, which means that women counsel other women based on their shared life experience of being born female into an oppressed class and treated and socialized the way women and girls are throughout their lives. Victims of domestic abuse, Rape and prostitution can train to become counselors and help other women. So when Kimberly Nixon appeared in the training group, the three women on duty took him aside and explained that the collective had a position that women are born into oppressive circumstances that shape their lives. And they explained that because Nixon didn't have those experiences, he would not be invited into the training group. This apparently amounts to discrimination not being permitted to access a volunteer position in a transition house for women escaping and healing from male violence. This was not, again, about refusing to support trans-identified victims of violence. And it's not even about protecting women from male violence within the transition house. It's not only about that in any case. It's also about a key principle of the women's liberation movement, which is consciousness raising. And that there is and has always been an understanding that certain conversations can be had and certain awareness can be raised around the common experiences of women and girls and that that can only happen among women. This is indeed how the second wave began, through consciousness raising groups, through women getting together and talking about their lives and shared experiences of oppression, harassment, abuse, and other forms of sexism, and realizing, oh, it's not just me, it's all of us, and how do we change this? So within all this focus on bathrooms and the right to pee, used by trans activists as a means to diminish women's concerns and position us as cruel aggressors, refusing others basic human rights, we lose sight of the purpose of this movement, the trans rights movement which is to destroy female solidarity, to gaslight us all into believing that victims are powerful abusers, to remove our ability to even discuss women as a class of people and therefore in needs of rights and spaces of our own, as well as, of course, to destroy any possibility of political organizing. There is nothing to organize around as feminists if there are no women, and if women don't have a particular experience historically, socially, and politically in this world. Exactly. This is the most ingenious and insidious backlash against feminism to date. Today, to define woman as adult human female, has been framed as hate speech. So has the notion that one cannot change biological sex. 
Stonewall, Britain's premier LGBT charity, defines the term trans as anyone whose gender is not the same as or does not sit comfortably with the sex they were assigned at birth. Which, putting aside the fact that sex is not assigned but observed, <laughs> applies to almost everyone. Certainly to feminists who have always rejected sexist gender roles and the notion that women are inherently passive and enjoy being treated as sexualized objects that exist to please the male gaze. But we cannot say that the rejection of said roles do not make a person trans or literally the opposite sex. We also can no longer say that only women get pregnant and give birth. The effect of this is that we cannot name the root of patriarchy, which came to be at the point men realized they played a role in reproduction and wanted to control their bloodline, which meant controlling women, those who were responsible for birthing and caring for said bloodline. We can no longer say that it is men who are primarily responsible for violence against women, which means that we cannot defend our need for women-only spaces or for spaces like transition houses and shelters. We cannot, in other words, name reality or name a reason the women's movement need exist at all. Yeah. So there's more to it than just the men as a threat angle, uh, lest we get tied up in discussing how men are perpetually predatorial and women are perpetually victims, which is not to say that women are not vulnerable to men, of course they are and this is much of the point, but there is also the political angle that underpins all of this. We cannot allow this conversation to continue to be reduced to predatorial men in bathrooms. In Vancouver, a trans activist and wannabe politician named Morgan Auger, ogre if you will, <laughs> headed up a campaign to pressure the city to remove funding from Vancouver Rape Relief. This wasn't actually funding for the transition house itself or for services for women, but it was for public education, which Rape Relief does for free and has for decades. They hold talks and panels and show documentaries that educate people about women's rights, the realities of marginalized women, of male violence, and of the feminist movement. They are probably one of the only organizations doing this in Canada. OJ would, of course, go after any grant he could any funding he could for any group or organization that fails to comply with his agenda, but this particular law seems significant to me in that it attempts to stop women from gathering and speaking and learning from one another. It cuts us off from our history and from political organizing. And the city complied, of course, as our most progressive politicians fear being disliked by a few angry men more than they fear a dissolution of the feminist movement. Certainly more than they desire to protect women and enable them to live lives safely and autonomously. Women have always had to fight to tell the truth. Centuries ago, women were too outspoken. Women who were too outspoken and who talked back would be branded witches and burned at the stake or tortured with devices now replicated for BDSM something women are now told constitutes female empowerment and liberation. Women who spoke out were made to wear scolds bridles and paraded around the village to teach other women a lesson. You too will be shamed, ostracized, and tortured. Don't be like her, don't speak up, don't support her, or it will happen to you. Today, women like me are held up as an example used to instill fear in other women. Do not side with her, do not support her, do not stand up and do not speak out, or you will too be smeared, vilified in the press, threatened with violence and death, ostracized by your community, abandoned by your friends, fired from your jobs, pushed out of your political circles, and banned from social media. <laughs> Of course, far too many women are far too rebellious to surrender. Women are organizing and speaking out and pushing back regardless. 
That's why we are here at this event today. We have all been labeled dangerous and hateful. On the event page for the protest against this event, I was referred to as a professional anti-trans hate writer. <laughs> Who knew that could be like a career? <laughs> and what did I say to earn this descriptor? That men are not women, that one's sex is immutable, that one can and should push back against gender stereotypes and live one's life in a way that feels authentic and comfortable, that boys and girls should play with whatever toys they like, that female athletes should not be made to compete against and with male athletes, <laughs> and that it's dangerous to allow males access to certain spaces wherein women and girls are vulnerable. I have rejected the term cis, which posits <laughs> which posits that all females who identify as women embrace femininity. I have expressed concerns about putting children on hormones and puberty blockers that have tremendous <laughs> that have tremendous lifelong health implications and that render them sterile. I have questioned the notion of gender identity, which claims one can feel like a woman on the inside, and that feeling like a woman is attached to things like wearing high heels, having long hair, and enjoying sexual objectification. I have rejected the notion that these feelings are what define a woman, not the material reality of being born female. I have defended Vancouver Rape Relief's right to define their own membership, to create and protect space for women to escape male violence, heal, and organize. I have challenged media, politicians, lawmakers, activists, corporations, social media companies, NGOs, public institutions, and friends on their choice to throw women under the bus in favor of Newspeak because it is financially, politically, or socially beneficial in the short term to do so. I am not hateful, I'm truthful, and it would do us all well to think hard about what it says about the integrity and values of a person who frames the truth as hate. And whether or not these are the kinds of people we wish to lead us towards progress and emancipation. Nothing you say can touch her. Nothing. Okay, next up, I, I think we're done with this particular outburst, or we're going to move on here? Okay. Uh, next up, we have Saba Malik, is a long time. Uh, 
a longtime radical feminist and environmental activist. She's a founding member of Deep Green Resistance and a board member of the Fertile Ground Institute. I'm a little bit smaller than those other two. Hello. Thanks for coming. There's lots of you. Can, can you hear me okay, or am I buzzing? Okay. Um, I'm going to speak uh, not just on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of my sister in struggle, Cherry Smiley, an indigenous woman who was not able to be here today at the event for personal reasons. Um, so I'm going to do my bit, and then I'm going to do her bit, okay? So anyway, so my name is Sabah Malik, hello. And I'm grateful to be here tonight. Um, I thought long and hard before accepting the offer to speak uh, on this panel, partly because my life is a very busy one, and so any time away from my family uh, necessarily comes with some disruption to them and to me. But also because this topic has become so contentious that it involves a certain amount of risk. Now, before becoming a mother, uh, the, that would not have been a reason for me to decline. But knowing that my children might face backlash because of my views, that certainly gives me pause for thought. Um, I decided, finally, that it was important for my voice to be part of this panel for two good reasons. Um, the first, because it's important to speak the truth and, and show solidarity. Show solidarity with women who are risking their well-being, their reputation, and in some cases, their careers to be here. And also, and this is really important, because I felt that as a woman of color, um, I should be here to refute the idea that believing biology is important and that a woman is an adult human female is the same as being racist. Yeah. You know, trans activists and, and their supporters have more than once characterized themselves as the new civil rights frontier. Now, as a woman who's experienced racism personally, systemically, and systematically, I find this comparison distressing and actually really offensive. But let me say really clearly, uh, I firmly believe that all human beings deserve basic human rights. They deserve to live without fear of oppression or violence, to have access to housing, to have access to jobs and equality before the law and judicial systems. Whoever you are, however you dress, however you present yourself, however you identify, none of that is up for discussion at all. So the reason I find the charge of my beliefs vis-a-vis -vis the protection of women's sex-based rights being the same as racism is that it's a false comparison and it completely obscures the issue. It's a false comparison to conflate 400 years of slavery, murder, rape, torture, Jim Crow, and the segregation of public spaces by whites against black people with attempts to open women's bathrooms, shelters, prisons, locker rooms, and other female-only spaces, thanks for the love, um, and other female-only spaces to male-born people simply on the basis that they identify as women. That apparently makes me transphobic, or even a Nazi, actually. Now, as a woman of Muslim and Pakistani heritage, that word transphobe has often felt to me uh, like the term 
anti-American, or anti-American, as you lot say. <laughs> and uh, I've been accused of being both. <laughs> so um, I compare these two slurs because both of these terms are used to fire up emotions uh, and to shut down any kind of robust discussion. What does it mean to be transphobic? Phobia means uh, having an unexplained fear, okay? I, I don't have an unexplained fear of, of people who identify as transgender, I don't. I have a disagreement with their definition of what gender is, okay? That's a far cry from being phobic. I'm not here to encourage violence towards anyone. I'm not here to claim that I'm better or that I'm superior, or that I'm more evolved than anyone else. I'm here to question the idea that womanhood is something which anyone can identify into. So back to the idea of false comparisons. When I think of the civil rights movement and whatever has been captured about it in writing, in film, media, pictures, etc., what I'm confronted with is images of black people being attacked by dogs, uh, state-sanctioned violence, okay, by dogs and clubs and water hoses while they linked arms and tried to withstand the brutality of the opposition. I'm confronted with images of white adults braying abuse and screaming at the children who were picked to first desegregate schools in this country and of those children being escorted by police and armed guards just to enter a building. So the irony, the claim of my being racist is not lost on me when I, along with the other panelists, had to be escorted tonight by police through a separate entrance because of the protest over this event, and also because of numerous threats and suggestions of harm to us personally, in, including a bomb threat earlier today where they had the police and the sniffer dogs and, and everything. I've received both rape and death threats for choosing to be here tonight. I know these other women have too. I find it interesting how the rape threats keep coming, almost as though we have some bodily char characteristic that played an important part in that definition. What I don't understand is why I'm called violent when I have not threatened anyone. I have never called for anyone to be deplatformed or removed from a job simply because they disagree with me ideologically. And yet my disagreement is, for, is, I did, is defined as a form of violence by trans activists. My belief that sex-based rights, which women have fought so hard for, are important and not negotiable, is considered as bad as racism and an attempt to erase trans people. I'm not sure how that's even possible. My disagreement with someone does not erase them. If that were true, none of us would be here, <laughs> right? Because there's not a single human being alive who doesn't know someone who disagrees with some part of their ideology. I don't like the term cis woman, but if someone calls me a cis woman, it's not violence, and it doesn't erase me. I would have had, had to have an incredibly fragile existence for that to be true. <laughs> <clears throat> Biological sex is important. Historically, women's biology has been the basis of our oppression since civilization reared its head. We were not oppressed because we performed womanhood in some way or wore certain clothes. We were owned by men. So our sexual and our reproductive capacities could be commodified, as well as our labor. When humans first moved away from hunting, gathering, and they started to practice agriculture, they found that it required a large labor force, and, uh, as well as more and more land, right? So tribes who conquered other tribes would kill all the men, and they would keep the women. And they did that because women can reproduce, and a constant supply of workers is necessary. 
There was the added benefit of women's forced labor and being used for sexual gratification. Women in this country were still chattel um, as late as the late 19th century, maybe even more. Uh, that means that they were owned by their male relatives. I mean, that literally means that they could be bought, sold, won, and lost in card games, and they were. You can look it up, look at it, his, history. Um, so those hard-won sex-based rights that women before us campaigned for, and in some cases lost their lives for, are incredibly important because they are an acknowledgement that women as a class have suffered immensely at the hands of men as a class. Those Title IX rights are still important. Women and girls have a right to their private spaces. They shouldn't be afraid to express that. Many young girls don't want to share their locker rooms and other private spaces with boys who claim that they're girls. They don't want to compete against them in sports either, but they're too afraid to say. They think that that's unfair. What about their rights? What about their rights? This is, a, this is a core distinction between those of us who are silenced uh, on the one hand and trans activists on the other. Trans activists go beyond promoting civil rights for trans people by insisting that trans women are literally women and that as such they're entitled to unfettered access to women's spaces, sports, affirmative action slots and more. It feels like the silencing of women all over again. The extremists have succeeded in injecting the trans women are women concept into all sorts of policies already adopted by sports associations, school districts, and government agencies. They're pushing for more. The Equality Act in the US Congress gives gender identity, a person's self-declaration as to whether they're male or female, regardless of biological reality, precedence over sex as a protected category in federal civil rights laws. These are enormously important decisions being made that will literally affect thousands of women and girls, and yet a robust discussion and critique of those policies is not allowed. It's past time for people to stand up and be counted and to stop being afraid. One of my old professors sent me a message before my appearance here today, and I wish to share that message with all of you as I end my portion of the talk. She said to me, courage calls to courage everywhere. I hope that's true. Thank you for that. So, um, as I said, my, my, my sister, Cherry Smiley, um, could not be here today. She is from uh, the Intlakupmuk uh, Thompson tribe on her mother's side and the Navajo Diné on her father's side. And this is what she asked me to say to everyone tonight. Thank you to everyone who has come here today to listen, learn, and question the idea of gender identity and how it impacts women and girls. Thank you to the panelists and organizers who put this event together. A special thank you to my sister in struggle, Sabah, for inviting me to speak through this letter and for sharing her time with me. What I had wanted to speak about today was the ways in which transgender ideology is being uncritically accepted in culture, law, and policy and the ways in which indigenous women are silenced by trans activism. In universities and among activists today, I often hear that pre-colonization, indigenous cultures had many genders and transgender or two-spirit identified individuals were respected and held leadership positions. Maybe this was true in some nations, 
but it was not true for all nations. Generally, we find third, fourth, fifth genders in cultures where gender roles were very rigid already. My grandmother's historical research and also her life experience tells me that many, if not most nations, had much less rigid ideas about gender, not more. To have one sex dependent on the other for basic needs seems more of a reflection of modern culture than anything else. For example, if only men knew how to hunt and hunted, what would happen if a number of men were injured or ill or died? What would happen in the middle of a tough winter when everyone needed to pitch in? It would make sense that most members of a nation, female and male, would need to know how to survive and be able to put the knowledge into practice. This would mean less rigid gender roles. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, why does it matter? I used to believe very strongly that most indigenous nations in Canada were matriarchal and that women were respected and they held leadership positions. Maybe this was true in some nations. <laughs> but it wasn't true for all nations. At the time, this claim served my relief, my belief, her belief. After some serious self-reflection and research, I have come to understand that I was mistaken to rely on this claim to advocate for the liberation of indigenous women and girls. These kinds of claims, whether they work for our beliefs or not, silence discussion, in particular, the claims about gender and transgendered identified individuals being leaders and revered medicine people pre-colonization work to silence feminist women who want to abolish gender. It used to be this way, so it should be this way, is an impossible claim to prove. It's politically lazy, and it abandons women from historically patriarchal cultures, and has been long used to justify male violence against women and girls in many cultures, including ours today. Also, and importantly, what I know from my grandmother is that in in Tlakmatbuch culture, homosexuality was accepted, but there was also an understanding that female and male bodies are entirely different. Male-bodied people were not allowed into female ceremonies or sacred rites, and vice versa. Indigenous women in Canada fought for decades for a national inquiry into murdered and disappeared indigenous women and girls, and when we got that national inquiry, it became about women, girls, and the two SLGBTQQIA communities. Emphasis on the two, SL, two SLGBTQQIA communities without any notice or discussion. We were told to make sure that men who identified as two SLGBTQQIA were included and disproportionate amounts of time and resources and energy went into discussing everyone else but indigenous women in our own inquiry. If the issue of male violence against indigenous 2SLGBTQQIA communities is as pressing as they claim, an appropriate strategy would have been to demand a separate inquiry on that issue so that it could be thoroughly examined. There are specific historical and contemporary reasons and solutions as to why women and girls, particularly indigenous women and girls, are harmed and attacked by men. I don't believe in the idea of gender identity. Biology is a material reality. Human beings cannot change sex, and men oppress women on the basis of our sex. Gender is made up of rules, limitations, and expectations that harm women and benefit men. To say that we are each born with a gender identity is an idea that can and should be debated, and its impacts on our material realities as women examined with a feminist analysis. This is a really important point. The idea of gender should not be examined in isolation. When it is those critical of gender identity, when it is those critical of gender identity are often right-wing, conservative, and or religious men from organizations that advocate for sexist, racist, and classist policies that hurt women. 
The debate around gender is important for feminists because it forms a foundation for our movement. How can we even begin to form a feminist analysis that centers women if we are pressured to believe anyone is a woman and we are told to include and prioritize men who identify as transgender women in our work? How can we fight for women and girls when we are not allowed to set our own priorities, our own boundaries in regard to our politics, our organizing, and our safety? This has broader implications for other oppressed communities. We need to take a stand on this issue, but always in the context of working towards women's liberation in a patriarchy and always with the knowledge that there is lots of work to be done on many issues. Indigenous women who don't say and do what white people want us to say and do are being silenced. I've personally experienced online harassment. I've been denied opportunities, kicked off stages and out of conferences, threatened with the police, threatened by men, and so much more, often by academics and activists, because I have different beliefs and a different political analysis of a single issue, gender. That impacts everyone. The message this sends is that indigenous women are only welcome to speak if we say what you want us to say. To this, I say, no deal. <laughs> Disagree with me, challenge me, but I am allowed to say that I love and fight for women and girls. I am allowed to say what I think, and that's what I'm going to do. And our final panelist tonight is Kara Dansky. She's a lawyer, longtime feminist. She serves on the board of the Women's Liberation Front, where she coordinates legal policy and media work. I'm short like Saba. Good evening, and thank you for having me. As Lear said, my name is Kara Dansky. I serve on the board of the Women's Liberation Front. I'm an attorney with a background in women's rights, criminal justice, and civil rights. I have to say it's wonderful to be in Seattle. I used to live here, and it's great to be back. Because you just clapped for that, I will also say, because I am in Seattle, I will say, go Seahawks. <laughs> go beast mode. We had a great run this season. I am here to talk specifically about gender identity in US law, and I will do that building on some of the things that Megan and Saba have said. But first, I would like to make a brief statement. I am extremely angry. I suspect that many of us are extremely angry. We on this panel are all capable of speaking on the topic of gender identity, in a relatively measured way, because we are accustomed to doing so. I put air quotes on gender identity just then, so when I use the phrase gender identity throughout the rest of this talk, please imagine air quotes <laughs> around the phrase, because gender identity isn't real in any material, real-world sense. We on this panel, have been called to speak about gender identity in the media, on social media, and in our regular lives with regular people. And so we have found that we have no choice to speak on this topic, and we do in a polite manner, as we, as women, are so often required to do. To be clear, I do not think that any of us actually want to be talking about gender identity at all. In addition to her feminist work, Lier has spent her entire adult life and career fighting for the planet and its inhabitants. I suspect that Megan would probably rather be speaking out against the violence of pornography and prostitution, and that perhaps Saba would prefer to spend her time ending the violence of racism. 
Personally, I would very much like to be fighting for reproductive sovereignty for women, including abortion on demand and without apology. All of us have spent our lives fighting for justice in one way or another. And yet now we all find ourselves in the following situation. We have to talk about the violence, misogyny, and homophobia of gender identity because we have no choice but to do so. But then, men forcing women to do things that we do not want to do is hardly novel. I am angry that the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence can report the following statistics regarding domestic violence in the United States. We're all familiar with these. One in four women experience severe intimate partner physical violence, intimate partner sexual violence, and or intimate partner stalking with impacts such as injury, fearfulness, post-traumatic stress disorder, and death. One in seven women have been seriously injured by an intimate partner. One in 10 women have been raped by an intimate partner. One in four women have been victims of severe physical violence, for example, beating, burning, or strangling by an intimate partner. These are averages, and the situation is far worse for black women than for white women. Lesbians are routinely harassed, attacked, and beaten for the sin of being female homosexuals, and today, lesbians are being told that they are hateful bigots because they refer, refuse to acknowledge the lie of the female penis. <laughs> to be clear, when any of us read or hear or speak the statistics that I read above, every single person knows exactly what is meant by the word women. Literally no one is confused by this. The man who forced his penis inside of my vagina when I was 19 years old did not ask me for my preferred pronouns before doing so. Literally every person hearing these words knows exactly what I'm talking about. And yet we have been told that we are not permitted to fight for women and girls as women and girls. The mob awaits us. So now I will talk about gender identity and the law and I will do so dispassionately as women are obligated to do, notwithstanding this simmering rage. I will be speaking primarily about US law and its origins because that is what I am most familiar with. Let's start with some history and we're going to go back a bit. The Magna Carta, promulgated in 1215, <laughs> is generally considered to be the original source of US law. Don't worry, I'll go quickly. It is well known that the Magna Carta's primary purpose was to grant political and religious rights to male aristocrats and to grant some rights to lesser but still property-owning white men and their white male heirs. It is less well known that under the Magna Carta, a widow was permitted to inherit her husband's estate and to remain in his house for 40 days after his death before being evicted. Widows, however, were not permitted to remarry without first receiving the permission of a baron. The Magna Carta also provided that a man could not be punished for killing another man if the murder complaint was made by a woman, unless the murder victim was the woman's husband. These are the sole references to women in the Magna Carta's entire 63 provisions, all of which went to great lengths to emphasize the rights of men. In 1606, King James of England signed the first Virginia Charter, establishing the colony of Virginia. The charter granted all colonial governing authority and all of the property that it stole from indigenous Americans to eight white men. Later, King James would appoint a man, Lord Delaware, to serve as colonial governor. The king granted the residents of the colony all of the rights that residents of England and its other colonies had. For women, of course, this meant zero rights. The charters establishing the, 12, the other 12 American colonies were similar to the Virginia Charter and that they granted all governing authority and all stolen property rights to white men. In 1776, of course, Congress famously declared that men are created equal, and in 1789, the US got its constitution, which gave individual states the authority to determine voting rights. Not a single state at that time granted women the right to vote. We don't have to limit this historical discussion to voting rights, as important as they are. We could also talk, for example, 
about how a 17th century law in Massachusetts provided that women could be executed for luring men into marriage by wearing high-heeled shoes. <laughs> women were granted the right to practice law in US federal court in 1879, but most states still prohibited women from practicing law in their state courts. And of course, abortion was outlawed in most of the United States throughout most of US history. This is just a tiny list of times throughout US history when US law has explicitly discriminated against women. And let's be perfectly clear. All of the men making all of those laws over all of that time knew exactly what the word woman means. There have been some tremendous gains, of course. We have Roe v. Wade to protect abortion rights for now. Thanks in part to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in 1971, the Supreme Court decided that women are people under the law. We are allowed to have our own bank accounts and credit cards. We're even allowed to have law degrees. These are good and hard fought developments and feminists should be proud of the work that we have done and the gains that we have made to protect women in the law. Gender identity is destroying all of it, everything. Everything that women have fought for is being annihilated by gender identity in the law. I will now talk a little bit about how gender identity is annihilating women at the federal level in the US. If anyone has questions about how gender identity is being enshrined into law at the US state level, we can do that later in the Q&A, but we don't have time to go into it now. As many of us know, the question of what the word sex means is currently before the United States Supreme Court in a case called Harris versus EEOC, which involves a man named Amy Stevens who is demanding legal recognition to be female. If the Supreme Court decides that Stevens is literally a woman, then women will be obliterated as a category worthy of civil rights protection in the United States, and centuries worth of work will be undone. It's as simple as that. The Women's Liberation Front has filed a friend of the court brief in the case arguing that sex stereotyping in employment constitutes unlawful sex discrimination and opposing employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. We expect to hear this spring or summer whether the Supreme Court thinks that women are allowed to exist in the law. The question of what the word sex means is also before the United States Congress. As Saba mentioned, the so-called Equality Act has been before Congress for several years, but this year the US House of Representatives took the unprecedented step of voting to pass it. The Equality Act, like a bad ruling in the Stevens case, would obliterate women and girls as a discrete legal category for civil rights protection. Incidentally, Congress is also considering a bill called the Fairness for All Act as an alternative to the Equality Act. The Fairness for All Act is terrible. Like the Equality Act, it would replace the legal category of sex with gender identity. But crucially, it would exempt religious institutions. What this would mean in practice is that religious institutions would be able to maintain sex segregated spaces, but public institutions such as public schools would not. It essentially encourages the idea that religious women and girls are entitled to sex segregated spaces, but other women and girls are not. The Fairness for All Act would also give religious institutions a legal excuse to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, which Wolf adamantly opposes. The upshot of all of this is that it is simply not possible to both protect women and girls and protect gender identity in the law. Federal law can either protect women and girls in order to make up for centuries of unfairness and injustice, or it can protect a self-declared and under undefined identity. It cannot do both. So let's pull this all together. The men in power for thousands of years enacted countless laws with the deliberate intention of keeping women out of power and out of civil society purely on the basis of sex. And now at the altar of gender identity, we are expected to simply pretend that sex does not exist. No. I want to make one final point here. Lawmakers who take an interest in this topic often say that they want to ban transgender athletes from women's sports or that they want to ban unnecessary medical procedures for transgender children. These efforts are often well-intentioned, but they're misguided. If there are any, out, any lawmakers out there listening, please take note 
There is simply no such thing as transgender. <clears throat> Gender is a caste system designed to keep women in our place and must be abolished, not enshrined in the law. Women are female, men are male. It's not complicated. <clears throat> in conclusion, Women are being fired from our jobs for saying the kinds of things that we are saying here today. At least two members of Wolf have been fired from progressive nonprofit organizations for having the audacity to stand up for women and girls. Another has lost an important sor source of contract-based employment. Yet another member has been erased from her position in her doctoral department. These are actual cases that are actually happening and have actually happened. This is the new misogyny. It's the same as the old misogyny, but with a postmodern twist. And finally, to paraphrase something that radical feminists often say on the topic of gender, only men could oppress women for thousands of years and then turn around, put on a dress, and claim to be the most marginalized group in society. Women have had it, we are angry, and we are not taking it anymore. Okay, we got it. Um, so we have time for questions and answers. And we have the space until nine o'clock, so we actually do have some time still. And the way that we're gonna do this is, uh, there are, on either side, you'll see mic stands, mics. So you have to line up if you wanna ask a question and speak into the mic. And if there's a specific panelist you wanna address, that's fine. Uh, we do ask that you keep your questions short. And by that, I mean three sentences. And that third one should end in a question mark. <laughs> so, so that's what we're going to do. So be brave. Come on down. We would like to hear your voices. You can go over there. You can get in line. Over there. We have seven women in Seattle Council. We have police women. We have sheriff women. We have too many women. Where is woman discrimination in Seattle? Can you find me? Okay. Huh? Come on, guys. You're really cute I to stand up at a women's rally and say that. It's I have adorable. 11 trust. Shut up. Okay. I have 11 well, trust. You, so you're over, you're, you're over time. You way more than three, three sentences. Come on. Thank you. All right, you can have a seat, please. Thank you. How dare I attend a women's event as a woman? Panelists, what do you think is the long-term trajectory of the trans movement, quote unquote, flying too close to the sun, the Icarus phenomenon, and maybe bringing us all back to sanity? Because I think a lot of us here were like, okay, you wear a dress, we call you she, whatever, but then they started invading women's spaces and that's when it became a key problem. And do you think they've asked for too much and now it'll finally start to go back the other way? Okay, it's enough. We've had enough. We've had enough. We've had enough. Bye bye, Nazi B. Bye bye, Nazi.
so Nazi bitches. Just Let's a answer good old question. fashioned sexist. Right? It never changes. Okay. Yeah, I, I just borrowed it totally from the woman right here. I plagiarized it. Um, that's a great question. Um, and I wish that I had a happy answer. I don't because I'm not sure where it's going to end. It seems completely nuts to me that to say that a woman is an adult human female is somehow controversial. And that men, you know, guys who believe that they're women should have access to all these spaces. I think, I feel as though that a little bit that the tide is turning. Um, especially when events like this get sold out for capacity. It's, it's, obvi it's obviously a, a debate that many people think about and are concerned about, but as I said in you know, my, my speech, that people are just too scared to take it on because they're scared of losing their jobs. Mostly they're scared of being seen as mean because you know, the Nazi and the, oh, you're just like a racist, which is why I felt it was so important just to say, that's such a false comparison. And if anyone says that to you, you really have to just stick up for yourself and say, that's a disgusting comparison. How dare you? So uh, my question is for Kara Dansky. Uh, what do you think the common average citizen in America can do to fight the Equality Act. So, uh, so the Equality Act has already passed in the United States House of Representatives despite Wolf's opposition and public testimony. However, it is before the United States Senate, which is a little busy these days. <laughs> so most people who think about these things do not think that Senator McConnell will bring the Equality Act before the Senate floor. However, however, it is always a great idea to cultivate relationships with our representatives and senators and to talk about these issues because it is coming back. It is definitely coming back. And if the Senate flips, then we're definitely gonna see a resurgence of the Equality Act. So it's worth always cultivating relationships with your representatives and senators. Senators, And I also just wanna say, sometimes I think people feel really intimidated about doing that kind of activism. Um, and I understand why it can be intimidating, but it's actually, our representatives work for us and they will hear you. They will have meetings. Even if you are not going to Washington, they all have local offices not far from where most of us live. So you can get meetings in local offices with staff and educate them on these issues. And the last thing I'll just say in response is please do not be concerned or intimidated if your representative is someone from a different party. Because if you are a Democrat and you are represented by a Republican, it is really good to educate Republicans about the fact that there are Democrats who are pushing back against this. Most of them don't know that there are lefty critiques of gender. So they need to be educated by us. Um, and, I, and if you're a Democrat and you're represented by a Democrat, then it's like even more important, right? But, um, but so we can all do this. And it's not, it's not public activism. So those of us who are concerned about being in the public eye on this issue, Going to talk to staff in a local office does not require putting yourself out there in a local paper or in a local TV station. They will have private meetings with you. You do not have to go public to actively engage in that form of activism, and it's so important. I was born biologically male. Um, I do have an identity disorder. Um, so my question is, um, I agree with much of what's being said here, and I think that it's um, un <laughs> I'm sorry. I think that it's um, towing the line of unethical to transition people like me with, with this disorder. Um, I'm just wondering if, I, I, over the past 15 years since I transitioned, I've, I've actually viewed this as just a repackaged version of conversion therapy. 
And my question to you is, and, and I actually feel that, believe that in you know, the next decade or, or 20 years, what we're gonna find is, is the medical community and the psychiatric community um, being prodded by this nonsense outside um, into transitioning people like myself and mutilating our genitals and castrating us. Um, that there's, I, I see a trajectory of, of, of them hopefully in the future being held accountable for, for this behavior. So my, my question is, 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 do you see that? Do you hope for that? And, and you know, um, I, I, I do want to support this. So if there's any way of um, donating or something, you know, thank you. Um, thank you for coming to this event and thank you for speaking publicly with your background that's incredibly brave and important. Really brave. You would say that. And I, I want, I want, I'd like, if I, if I could, just to make one uh, uh, comment about what you said is that it's repackaged conversion therapy. Um, and speaking, uh, you know, about countries like Iran, which is also part of my heritage, and my mother is one-fourth Iranian, and uh, Pakistan, where they're incredibly homophobic. And so if you're homosexual, they would rather transition you than accept uh, the, the homosexuality. And as a result, the Iranian women's uh, football team, or soccer team, you say out here, sorry. I'm gonna call it football. Foot and ball, okay. <laughs> The, the Iranian women's football team, nine of their 11 players are transitioned. Uh, they're, they're homosexuals who have been made to transition. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I do think that, I think that the tides are turning in terms of, you know, people aren't accepting this anymore. Um, people are speaking out, people are, you know, especially this issue of, of sports where we're seeing, you know, a giant man standing alongside a woman with a gold, gold medal. Um, it's clearly ridiculous. Um, and I think that we are, unfortunately, I don't know that I see this as a positive thing, but I think we are going to unfortunately see a lot of lawsuits and, you know, even worse than that. I hope not worse, but I'm scared that worse things would go down. Um, because of these people who have been transitioned and who have been promised things that are impossible and, and the disappointment of that and the pain of that and the, the hurt of that and those people's real lives are just impacted in such horrible ways and it's really awful. So it doesn't give me hope that that's gonna happen but that is gonna be part of how the tides turn, I'm afraid. So glad to be here. Been following Megan on YouTube, and nice to nice to see. And I admire, I greatly admire your courage. It's very very inspiring. I, um, one of the questions I, I have, I, I could ask many, but I, I'm curious about uh, Megan. What you think about the uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria among women? And because it strikes me, if we're going to discuss misogyny. Um, and this is not a phrase I would use very often, but is this is this a in, internalized misogyny? Um, and if you could address that, and maybe other, the other panelists would follow up. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you you listen to the to the girls who are transitioning, and if you listen to detransitioners, um, they'll tell you stories that read very clearly as, you know, either internalized misogyny or you know trying to escape a world where they're being sexually harassed and objectified, and that's when that all starts happening. When you go through puberty, things change really quickly and in a really scary way, um, and sometimes in really horrible ways that involve you know, sexual abuse and molestation. Um, and if you, you listen to those girls, they'll often tell stories like that and you know, wanting to get rid of their female bodies, essentially. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the added issue of homophobia, where, where lesbians are are thinking, you know, maybe I'm actually a boy, maybe I'll be better off if I'm a heterosexual boy. Um, it seems like that's a trend within the LGBT community um, where it's sort of cooler to be a trans man than to be a young lesbian, um, which of course, again, is all, all attached to misogyny. So yeah, I, I do think that's a big 
part of it, for sure. And I just want to add that I have a 17-year-old daughter. She's a junior at high school, and that's almost exactly what she said. All of her friends who are transitioning from, uh, you know, female to male or want to are actually lesbians, and they just think it will be easier to be, a, you know, a boy, a trans, trans boy or whatever you want to say. It's, it's really sad. Okay, my, my question is about um, concerning the medical community. Um, as a biological female, I prefer to be seen by a biological female. And what I found is that when you look at a, a doctor's bio, it doesn't generally say too much about gender. And I've actually asked the question, is this an authentic girl doctor? And I don't know, I mean, the, the, the pauses and the silence that I get are like a little nerve wracking. Um, I'm, so I'm, I'm looking for suggestions on how one can more easily kind of segue into the medical community when you prefer a practitioner of a particular gender like your own gender. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's ridiculous. Unfortunately, so states and local governments handle things in wildly different ways. So there's not one standard across this country in terms of how issues like this happen. But unfortunately, we are living in a world, because of the way that gender identity has become enshrined in state, local, and federal law, it has become unlawful for, for medical care institutions to comment on the gender identity of their practitioners. So we're in a really murky legal, legal area because they are afraid of getting sued by their employees if the employer co makes a comment such as you are inviting them to make. So to be clear, I only see female gynecologists, I get it, I'm not questioning you in any way. It's just, it's, it's become extremely murky because Institutions are afraid of lawsuits, basically, because of the way that gender identity has made its way into the law. And that, but so, like, I don't want my orifices probed by a male. I mean, like, outside of a significant other. <laughs> but I, I just, I feel that that's doing a disservice to all women. It is. It's horrible, and it's a huge problem. Yeah. Thank you for naming it. That's, I mean, that is one fantastic example about how insidious it is for this stuff to make its way into the law. Hi. Um, hi, uh, my name's Katie Herzog. I'm a writer for The Stranger. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Um, at the, the risk of turning you all against me, I have sort of a tough question. Maybe this, is, this one's for Kara. So Kara, when we've spoken before, you know, you told me that the reason that you choose public libraries to hold your events in is because you'll get deplatformed in, in private spaces. And so we can thank this library and the First Amendment uh, for, for allowing this event to happen. So my question is, Wolf has also, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but Wolf has also protested against uh, Drag Queen Story Hour. And so how do you square those two things? And that's my first question. And also, has being, you guys were deplatformed at the New York Public Library? Has that changed your, your perspective on the need for all, all intellectual diversity in, uh, in public spaces like this? So, so just to clarify, the, for the Seattle Public Library to allow us to borrow this space to host a Wolf event is a very different thing from the Minneapolis Library, for example, putting on a Drag Queen Story Hour as a library event. So that's, that's how we distinguish. We think. We think it's inappropriate for libraries to be, to be having library-sponsored content that presents overly sexualized adults to children, and, and we feel comfortable taking that stance. Yeah. This, is very, this is a very different thing. This is just like we borrowed this space just like any other group could borrow this space. So if the drag queens wanted to hold it in a space like this, Wolf would be okay with it? I mean, we'd have to talk about it, but I, I don't know that we would have any legal reason to challenge it. or. 
engage in this kind of nonsense. <laughs> well, thank you, and thank you all for doing this. It takes big ovaries to be here. My name is Terry, and I want to thank all of the panelists for your courage in being here today. Um, I have been very close to a couple of trans-identified people in my life, and I've heard their detailed stories about how they just felt that they were the sex other than the one that their body was when they were growing up. And I believe them. And I understand that you all support civil rights for these people. Um, but we do live in a world where we do identify ourselves based on our sex, and we are segregated in various ways based on our sex. We choose doctors based on their sex. Uh, I, I find what you have to say a little bit lacking in compassion for the situations of these people. And I would love to see you develop a um, a more detailed vision of how these people can live in this sex-segregated world. I'm asking you, my question is, do you, can you speak in more detail about uh, how you would like such people to find their way in this world? I mean, I guess, I, like, I don't really disagree with you per se, but I mean, I feel like the trans activist movement isn't actually trying to do that. Like, I don't know why we can't support third spaces for trans identified people. I mean, I don't think it would be that hard to, to request that public buildings add, you know, separate gender neutral washrooms or change rooms, but then maintain the sex segregated ones as well. Um, and I think that I am quite compassionate towards these people, unless they're ridiculous. <laughs> and then it's hard. But, uh, you know, I, I do understand that there's some people in the world who suffer from what's called gender dysphoria. I disagree with that term, personally. But, um, and I understand that that's a hard life to live, but it doesn't mean that women have to give up everything. Or anything. I mean, I mean, we can't protect everybody. We can't make everybody's life perfect and comfortable. People are going to face challenges. I guess I just, I just want to say that the, there are so many ways of talking about the topic of, topics of gender and gender identity. And one that was brought up earlier was the medical scandal that's happening. And that is a huge issue. And it's really, really important to talk about. The title of this event is Fighting the New Misogyny. A, feminist critique of gender identity. That's what we're here to talk about. We could totally talk about that, but that's just not the topic of our event. That's a whole new movement. It is. It's, it's true, it started, it started. Hi, I'm Catherine Kirkpatrick. I'm the Legal Strategies Coordinator for Kelsey Coalition. I've had the pleasure of working with two of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I would like to ask all of you about nonpartisanship. Um, I think this is just an amazing experience. I'm sure, like you said, there are so many different ideologies, backgrounds, religions, political groups represented by this. And I know that you, like me, have listened to heartbreaking stories of medical harm from people and that medical harm and that industry that you know industrializes gender harm of young people, like this young man who spoke so bravely here, doesn't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or a Whig. And, um, and so I wonder if you would like to speak a little bit about the spirit of nonpartisanship and the, this is sort of general, general humanity of what's at stake here. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, this, this issue belongs to everyone. This is an issue that affects all of us. It's not just a feminist issue. It's not just a left issue. It's not just a right issue. I think that, I mean, I, everybody can fight this because it's bad for everybody, is my opinion. 
Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would, I would totally agree with what Megan is saying. This is not a left issue or a right issue. And I would just say on the specific topic of working in, in cross-partisan partnerships, there are many ways in which what we are seeing is an emergency. It is an emergency for women's rights. It is an emergency for the integrity and sanctity of children's bodies. Like this is, we're dealing with an emergency. And it is not only appropriate to work in a cross-partisan manner, but it would be irresponsible not to. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel. I'm a detransitioned woman. Thanks. Um, so my question for all the panelists, maybe this is a little off topic, but um, do you know of any researchers here in the United States who are um, gaining support in research on detransitioned people and the effects of long-term hormone use as well as the other medical abominations that are happening to young people? I mean, I, I know lots and lots of support groups and those kinds of forums. I don't know, I can't think of anybody who's doing actual research. Most of the research, honestly, is, I mean, as you, I'm sure you know better than me, has just been completely shut down. Yeah. It's impossible in academia to get any research done. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's almost impossible to get research done. You know, in academia, it's just been utterly shut down. You mean, you're not allowed to bring this up as a question without losing your job. So I don't know if there's actual research being done. It, obviously, we desperately need it. It's, yeah, it, it's so just, go ahead. So maybe you could, I mean, if you know of, uh, do, you, do you belong to a support group or do you know of support groups? Um, I belong to internet groups um, where detransitioned women come together for um, peer support. Um, but what I'm really looking for is um, people in the medical field, people who are um, able to research scientifically what happens to our bodies when we do these things to ourselves. Because my body was damaged. I... Um, I ended up, I was 23 years old, and I ended up with kidney failure because of hormone use. I know that there, there, there has been research done, but simply because this is not my area of expertise, I'm just, it's not coming to me right now, but I know that it's out there. Kaiser? What foundation? Oh, the Kaiser okay. Foundation, maybe. Um, Michael Laidlaw is an endocrinologist who has done some research into this. Um, and again, I just, I'm a little bit outside of my area of expertise, so, but, but the work has been done looking at situations like yours. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for your bravery. Hi, women, thank you for being here. Um, so I have a question, but there's also some comments mixed in there as well. Um, many black women and other women of color are in the same boat as myself. We feel isolated as if we don't have a place in this current feminist movement, particularly the radical feminist movement, because it is still very white-centered. So I would like to know um, what effort, what, um, what, it, what is Wolf doing to carve out space at the table for women of color to take a seat? Because um, with the exception of Saba, Race hasn't been mentioned by the other speakers. And for me, this is one of the biggest roadblocks for interracial movement building among women. I mean, it's a, it's a great question, and it's been a problem for a really long time that um, the concerns that you raise have been raised many times, not just with Wolf, but with a lot of primarily white-led feminist organizations. And Wolf is absolutely committed to dismantling all structures of oppression and power, including the oppression of racism. And I know that I know that in feminist spaces that I have been in, there's a lot more work to do. And Wolf is talking about these things on a regular basis and how we can be better and how we can do better, and I just want to acknowledge that it's a really important problem and we're not shying away from it. So I appreciate you bringing it into the space. I just want to say, it, it's hard. It's not, it, it's not easy. Um, I get that. I think 
for me, I mean, personally, what I've done is I've just got involved um, and run with it. That's what has worked for me. I'm not saying that it's something that will work for everyone, but partly it's getting involved and staying involved and having robust and difficult discussions when they come up um, and then staying the course, not running away. So, yeah, get involved. We need, we, yeah, we do, we need, we need, we need more, more, more women of color, for sure. You know, that, that, that's one of the reasons, like I said, I did this panel. And it's also one of the reasons that it was important for me to represent Cherry's voice here tonight. Hi, um, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. And um, one of you had said that you were surprised about the level of vitriol that you had received from the left. Uh, I'm a conservative and I'm here. And I was just curious if you are surprised at maybe the support that you've received from the other side of the aisle. I know somebody touched on that earlier, but I just wanted to know if you guys are encouraged or surprised by the crossover that we, we have in this arena. I mean, we may disagree on probably maybe everything else, but the one thing we do dis that we do agree on is this, this topic. And I was hoping and wondering if you guys were encouraged by that at all and if it has been something that has been able to reach across the aisle, so to speak, for you guys personally. Um, I definitely feel encouraged by it. And I really, I really appreciate, like I think that my involvement in this, in this issue, in this debate, and also, you know, getting kicked off Twitter, it, it, like, it sucks, <laughs> like, and it's hard, obviously, but I think that it was a real gift for me in a lot of ways because it connected me to people politically that I never would have connected right. with before because I was one of those leftists who just dismissed and wrote off people I labeled as right-wing or libertarian or anti-feminist or all those other labels that people use to dismiss people. And, you know, people are people, and... They don't not count because they don't share my exact politics. I'm I want to talk yeah. to all people, and I want to work with all people, um, regardless of you know, whether or not we disagree on various things. Hi. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I wanted to ask and address this question to the whole panel. Um, how and why it is that what seems like such a fringe marginal issue that affects, as I'm sure you all know, statistically less than 1% of the population, how in just a few short years this became such a hot button issue? Um, you know, there are movies and TV shows with trans characters now. Um, a lot of people <coughs> know someone or uh, children of a friend, if not their own children, in elementary school, middle school, high school, who are transitioning or thinking about it. Um, it's one thing for feminists to have an opinion on it, and it's one thing for the trans community to have an opinion on it, but it just seems unbelievable that millions of people who don't really pay attention to feminism or uh, politics or gender theory or anything like this are now all so familiar with uh, transgenderism and it's uh, you know it seems like it could even become a, a issue in the 2020 election this year as unlikely as that seems so like I said just want to address to the whole panel how and why you think we got here so quickly in just a, a few years ago when I, it seems like it all started with a discussion of, uh, of bathrooms and and now it's so much more so I just wanted to ask thank you I mean, I think that money is a big factor. There's, uh, I mean, who, who's the person who's done all that research into Jennifer? So Jennifer Bilek, if you look up some, does she have a website? Okay. Okay. The eleventh hour blog dot com, 11th as in the number. Um, she's done a great deal of research into how this whole movement has been funded, why it's funded. Um, so 
I encourage you to uh, go and have a look at that. And for anyone else who's interested, so I'll say that again, it's the 11th hour blog.com. B I L E K. Um, and just to add very briefly, I think the media's silence is utterly complicit in how this movement has been able to spread so far. And, I... and I'll, just, I'll just throw in here, too, that this is really a men's sexual rights movement, and that's why it's gotten purchase. It's a men's sexual rights movement. That's what it is. These are men with a very deep fetish. We're not allowed to say that out loud anymore, but it's called autogynophilia. That's who they are. It's what they want. And that's why this got purchased, is because men stick together over their sexual desires, and that's just the bottom line. And it's, it's ugly. And the other thing to remember is that, you know, how we do politics in this country, you have to buy your way in. And some of the people who gave Obama money, um, it was the Pritzker Foundation. It's a family of pharmaceuticals, and they are from Chicago. They know him personally. They bought him that seat in Illinois, and then they helped buy his way into the White House. This is all public information. It's not conspiracy theory. It's how politics work in the United States. And that was how he became. We have five minutes. Five minutes? OK, we can take one more question. And then we're going to have to come. I'm sorry. I know. I They've got to shut it down. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kaylee. I just want to thank you guys for being here. I know um, how much it's cost you to work alongside conservatives like me. Um, I'm humbled by that, and I am very grateful that you fight for all women. Um, and I want to ask you, as a conservative, what communications traps do you see us falling into all the freaking time that make the work harder for you? Because this is my world, and I, you know, Carrie, you've been generous enough to call me up and say, Kaylee, you can't say that, and I've learned. So I would really love for any conservatives here hearing, like, what we can do to help and what we can avoid saying to make things worse. So I really, really appreciate that, Kaylee. Um, this, is a, this is really a huge topic, but, um, but the basis of it is really conversations that Kaylee and I have had about how Republicans who, in some ways, like, they're really well-intentioned and they want to do the right thing on this topic, but they mess it up with the language that they use. So I kind of alluded to this in my talk, but when a, when a Republican lawmaker introduces a bill to ban trans athletes, that is dead in the water. Like, that is not going to work politically. It's just not going to fly. And we need to be really defending the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls. Because... I really feel like, I feel like when Republican lawmakers enter bills that say things like ban trans athletes, it makes it super easy for my side to paint conservatives as hateful bigots. Like it's just, it, it, that's never gonna succeed for women and girls, for Republicans to be using this language that does not help us in the more general cause. Anybody, somebody else. Also, I mean, you referred to the Fairness for All bill, mm -hmm. but trying to make like, religious exemptions for things, is, like, what does that have to do with the rest of us? I mean, this is a civil society. You know, we live in a civic world, and that it has to be true for all of us or none of us. So it doesn't really help to carve out a tiny little space where you can, you know, maybe keep, a, you know, one bathroom for women. Like, it has to be all of us. So it just, it doesn't, this is, a, you know, it's, we're not supposed to have a state religion. So... Like, just, we have to just keep that stuff out of it. Like, that's the entire point of the United States government was separation of church and state. So that, we just have to hold firm on that. She, she's begging you for another she's, she's begging, all right, go ahead, one more. <laughs> Turn it on? No, it should be on. Oh, two, there we go, now it's on. I, I am begging because there's a word I wanted to bring up, and I, I'm kind of a big systems thinker, so I try to look at everything as one. And I, what I see a perspective on this whole thing is that the old term used to be transsexual, 
Now it's transgender. With the advent of transhumanism and how technology is moving so quickly. Plus you take the fact that Seattle's the new Silicon Valley. It's no coincidence that Silicon Valley and San Francisco and Seattle's like the new small, they're trying to make it into Silicon Valley, where all the tech is, is where we have the most uh, transgender surgeons and we have the biggest activist movements. I see a real link between this whole transgenderism, the, mil the millennials, devices, algorithm information, trying to change the world in this way so that people will become very accepting in robots in 2030 when they finally hook our brains up to robots, which is what they're uh, predicting, that now, then we'll have robots' rights. Then that, that'll be the next so thing, right? Can we, They'll have so civil rights. Th so that is like so many more than three sentences and <laughs> no question mark. Preemptive um, programming. I, I agree. Preemptive programming. I completely That's agree with you. And even all the politics aside, there is such a profound hatred for the human animal in this movement. I, I just, I cannot understand it. Like what, uh, how did anybody decide it was okay t to mutilate children's genitals and to remove their sexual organs before they're even 12, 14, 15, they've never even had an orgasm, some of them. I'm, it's beyond me, like I don't care about the politics. How is it okay to do this to children? We're talking about people who will, they'll never have sex with a partner. Like how are we, it's like how much do we hate the human body, the human animal, that we are willing to do this to an entire generation? There's so nothing is, wrong with anyone's body. Nothing, nothing. And do not budge from that ever. Do not budge, right? There's nothing wrong with anyone's body. Not ever, not ever. That, that kind of loyalty, we've got to have that loyalty back to just our embodied selves, the, the human animal that we are. There's nothing wrong with it. So on that note. <laughs>